Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us again to talk about our response to be able to slow down the spread of coronavirus here in Nebraska. Today, we're going to be joined a little bit later by Sherry Dawson, who is our Director for Behavioral Health in the Department of Health and Human Services, and Annette Dubas, who is the Executive Director of the Nebraska Organization of, or sorry, the Nebraska Behavioral Health Organization. No, wait, I'm going to Association, the Nebraska Association of Behavioral Health Organizations. There we go. Sorry. And a former senator. So familiar, familiar to the building. Uh, before we get kicked off there, I just want to, again, as always, remind people about we're on day eight of our 21 days to stay home and stay healthy. We want people to stay home, stay healthy, stay connected. And, of course, we've got our six rules. Stay home. Don't take non-essential trips. Work. Work in a socially distanced way, you know, six feet away, that kind of thing, or work from home if you can. Shop. Go out shopping once a week. Take a list. Be efficient. Don't take the family. Four, make sure you help kids socially distance by playing at home, avoid playgrounds, avoid those large groups, group sports. Five, help seniors. Maybe you can go run errands for them so they can stay at home or go shopping for them so that they don't have to go out. That's a great way to help keep our seniors safe but don't go visit them in a long-term care facility. And then uh, number six, and finally, is exercise. And we're gonna talk a little about this as well. Exercise for that you know, physical health, but we're also a little bit later today gonna to be talking about mental health because that's gonna be important as well. So we can follow our six rules to stay home, stay healthy, stay connected. Uh, yesterday, I think that everybody saw that the president came out with his rules for opening up America again. And so it's got a phased approach into uh, reopening the economy. So a, a couple of points I'd like to make about that is, one, that that phase approach aligns with what we've been saying all along, right? That as we think about getting into May and loosening some of these restrictions, we're gonna do it a step at a time in a, in a very phased approach kind of way, the way the president had laid out there for as well. I think it's also important to note that that was one document for 50 states plus all the territories. When you've got a country as diverse as ours, no one document is going to work as a one-size-fits-all answer. That when you think about the difference between New York, for example, and them having more cases than many countries around the world, uh, if not almost all of them, just by themselves, or Wyoming that has very few, you've got a huge variety in the way that states are, have been impacted by the coronavirus. And so a one-size-fits-all document is not going to work. But I think that when you talk about how you phase these approaches in, that is something that works for everybody. So we're going to be taking a look at what the president has put out and using that feedback from our federal partners, as well as being in contact with our local partners and industry groups about, as we think about loosening these restrictions going forward, what that all means and how we will construct a plan that is right for Nebraska. Now, having said all that, too, I would remind people, we're not doing anything different in April. Okay, we're going to continue to focus on stay home, stay healthy, stay connected here in April. So we're only on day 8 of 21. We've got more work ahead of us as far as continuing to focus on those social distancing guidelines that we've talked about, these six rules, so that we can really, again, tamp down that virus here in our state. So please, continue to remember April. We're going to focus on that. Uh, Again, one of the things we talked about was uh, exercising daily in our six rules. We've talked about stay home, stay healthy, stay connected. Now, as we're social distancing, one of the things that may be difficult to do is to stay connected. And this can lead to isolation. Uh, people can become depressed, lack of that social contact. And it's important to think about your mental health just like your physical health. You know, we've, we've said as one of our six rules that we want people to exercise. Well, taking care of your mental health is also important. We want people to be able to do that as well, especially at a time when we're saying social distancing that could lead to that isolation. So there are a number of, there are a number of resources out there to be able to help folks who may be struggling with this. Uh, we've talked about the suicide prevention line, that 1-800-273-TALK. Uh, we've also talked about the Nebraska uh, Family Helpline, the 1-866-866-8660, that if you're looking for that, we also have a uh, rural, uh, Nebraska Rural Response Hotline at 1-800-464-0258. 1-800-464-0258. There's another resource, that Nebraska Rural Response headline, uh, Hotline. So there are resources out there for people who need somebody to talk to. Please take advantage of those. Talk to somebody. It's important to make sure we stay connected. 
And with that, I'm going to bring up Sherry Dawson, who's going to talk a little bit more about what we're doing in our, in our uh, behavioral health division. And then uh, Annette Dubas will talk as well. So Sherry, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Governor, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk about behavioral health, and the Governor has always been um, so supportive. Um, as he talked about, we know that behavioral health is essential to our overall health. And at this time, when we're experiencing the isolation and economic challenges, we are going to experience increased anxiety, depression, and other challenges um, to our mental health. So it's really critically important that we keep an eye that know that our overall health is really dependent on our mental health. So we can still practice safe social distancing. And I'm so proud of all the providers in the state that you can practice social distancing and still access services and resources. One of the things that's really key is um, uh, there's elements of recovery, home, health, community and purpose. And one of the biggest key tenets for recovery is community or social connectedness. So we can only do what each of us can control. And so I'm going to ask you to practice safe social distancing, but stay connected. We have so many people in our lives. We have peers, we have friends, we have people we go to church with, we have our neighbors, people in our community, and we always have providers and hotlines and helplines. Stay connected, but try and go about that connectedness in the normal spirit of your day. That will really decrease that isolation. So I know um, people have been reminded to eat healthy, to sleep. The governor has done that in many of these updates. But it's also important that we stay connected. Email, phone, um, Zoom, Skype. Um, I've heard of children and families doing um, screen high fives because they can't do hugs. Um, virtual coffee hours. I've heard there's virtual happy hours in Nebraska too. Um, virtual dinners, just stay connected and have some fun. Um, it will really help your overall mental health. And build a routine. We know that any time we can keep the familiar in a time of uncertainty, it's going to serve our mental health the best way possible. So continue to um, try and have a routine. And you know, if you're like a person that that's not your strength to be organized or plan your day, then reach out and get an accountability partner, somebody that can help remind you, keep you on track for some of those healthy habits. Pay attention to your body and your thoughts. We know that there will be times now with the anxiety that we may be more irritable, we may be sad, we may be angry, we may have difficult concentrating, we may not have the motivation, and we're just not doing those day-to-day -day tasks. And so whatever you can do to continue to be in a routine as healthy as possible, again, you're gonna serve your overall mental health. But the biggest thing I want you to know today is to reach out. It's OK to ask for help. We know normally, now this is without the coronavirus, that for behavioral health um, challenges that only 40% of people with a mental illness actually access treatment. And on the substance use side, it's even lower, only 16% access substance use treatment. And now we have a combination of um, exacerbating symptoms here in challenges. So please don't let stigma get in the way. Help us be champions for normalizing behavioral health conversations. It's okay to ask for help. You're definitely not alone. As the director of our Division of Behavioral Health, I know that Nebraska is blessed to have so many dedicated people in our system of care. We have public advocates for behavioral health. We have public and private behavioral health service providers. We have our DHHS, Division of Behavioral Health Regions, who help coordinate our system. We have university partners. We have pharmacies. We have um, peers that have experienced mental illness or substance use and are in recovery that reach out to people to help them heal. 
we also have our justice partners and we also have our other sister divisions in the DHHS that touch on behavioral health. And I'm here to tell you those providers are ready and I'm excited for Annette to talk a little bit about the innovative things that they're providing. Our behavioral health key partners meet together on a call every week. We talk together about questions, concerns, and share resources, information. We have a frequently asked questions um, document that continues to get updated. We're taking this new road together and we need to navigate it together. And one of the things that I think is um, really important to know is that we also have to take care of those who are caring for others. So the University of Nebraska Medical Center, Nebraska Medical Association, and other professional health care organizations are working together, are partnering to make sure that our health care providers have access to support and resources um, to help deal with the situation, the trauma, and build their resilience. We have an emergency system. The governor talked about our emergency lines. Please don't hesitate. There's no silly question. Just, it's okay to ask for help. The emergency system has crisis services that can still help you, even with social distancing. So please reach out. I'm happy to announce today, because our great behavioral health providers are continuing their daily business, um, that the Department of Health and Human Services and a partner, Community Alliance, um, in Omaha has received notice of a five-year grant, $2 million per year. It's a federal grant from the Substance Abuse Mental Health Service Administration, and it will help um, develop a model um, and evidence-based practices to fully integrate behavioral health. So mental health, substance use disorder, recovery, and physical health illnesses. And this won't just be for Community Alliance. When we built the grant together, we made it so those lessons learned can benefit the entire state. So both our rural and urban partners will benefit. So you know my message today, there is no health without behavioral health, and it's okay to ask for help. These are really challenging times, and I want you to reach out. And please take care of each other you might just be the difference to helping someone on their way to mental health and well-being. So I'm going to challenge everybody to have twice a week check-ins on mental health. So we'll have a Wellness Wednesday, so take responsibility and note Wellness Wednesday, and on Fridays it'll be Follow Through Friday. So whatever you identified on Wednesday, you'll have a check on Friday, and at least twice a week keep this focus. So I know you'll take care of yourselves. You will encourage the conversation so that people ask for help. And this is important. You guys know that, um, many of you know that I'm a nurse. And so Nurse Dawson wants you to do this and take time for your mental health. But it's just for the health, health of it. It's very important. So now it's my privilege to introduce um, Annette Dubas, who serves as the Executive Director of the Nebraska Association for Behavioral Health Organizations. Well, thank you, Sherry, and thank you, Governor, for giving me the opportunity to speak to the public today about behavioral health. Uh, I'm going to echo what Sherry just said. There is no health without behavioral health, and that is even more important now with what we're going through. Uh, I do appreciate the opportunity to talk about what is happening in the world of behavioral health during this particular emergency. Those dealing with mental illness and addictions have just had the way they receive uh, services turned upside down. And while social distancing does protect their physical health, it is very detrimental to their mental health. So paying attention to how they can uh, take care of their mental health is very important. Over the course of the past year, Nebraskans have been through multiple mentally challenging events. We've had the flood. We had the canal collapse out in western Nebraska. We've, we have the downturn in the ag economy. Uh, I'm understanding that the calls coming into the rural response hotline are competing with those calls, the number of calls that came in during the farm crisis of the 80s. I lived through that farm crisis of the 80s and it wasn't fun, so that indicates to me that you know, things are just as challenging now. 
The demand for mental health services is increasing. More people are reaching out. NABHO's members have quickly adapted to ensure continuity of care. But even with innovation, there are challenges. Not all services lend themselves to telehealth. Places like the Bridge here in Lincoln are continuing to provide services face-to-face -face for detox and residential services. We have multiple residential uh, service providers across the state who, who can't do what they do via telehealth. They are frontline workers, and they're taking new admissions every day. The Wellbeing Initiative and the Mental Health Association of Nebraska here in Lincoln they are a peer-run service organizations. They've moved their outreach using social media, and they're directing people to four free support groups per week using the Zoom platform. Facilities quickly purchase computers and other technology for their direct care. And while providers have been able to adapt to telehealth, not all clients have access to that needed technology. Many do not have the smartphones or the computers or access to Wi-Fi, so that makes it challenging for them to use telehealth services. Community Alliance, as, as Sherry just mentioned, in Omaha, they have set up six virtual telehealth rooms so clients in the facility can connect with their therapists to help those individuals who don't have access to that needed technology. Children's Hospital in Omaha has moved to over 350 telehealth, psychiatry, and psychology sessions per week. They're also doing their entire partial hospitalization eating disorder program virtually, doing meal monitoring, nutrition counseling, individual and family therapy, exercise, and meditation. Bryan Medical Center here in Lincoln is connecting individuals who are experiencing a mental health crisis in communities across Nebraska to Bryan West's Mental Health Emergency Room in Lincoln for mental health assessments using telehealth so that patient can stay in their home community and be assessed for what they need. The Friendship House in Grand Island is a men's halfway house. They have set up Google Voice numbers so their clients can reach their counselors any time of the day or night if in the event of a crisis. Those numbers are included in their voicemail and posted on the front door of their facility. Goodwill Industries of Greater Nebraska has adapted their day rehabilitation program to offer psychoeducational groups through phone and web conferencing. This has allowed them to continue providing daily support and socialization to nearly 50 individuals in Grand Island and Columbus. Behavioral health specialists in Norfolk over the course of three weeks onboarded 135 clients to telehealth with only five full-time therapists and a clinical director. They have transitioned three outpatient substance use groups and two intensive outpatient programs. She told me, we want to make sure that COVID does not define them but shows how behavioral health care can be re redefined and better than ever. There are so many other providers across the state when I put out the call yesterday for tell me what you're doing, I could be standing up here and with a whole long list of the things that providers are doing to make sure that their clients are being taken care of. They are working tirelessly so that their clients' behavioral health needs are met. But as Sherry also mentioned, those providers are having their mental health challenged as well. They're worried about their staff. They're worried about their clients. They're worried about funding. Seeing a, you know, with this transition to telehealth and the things that are going on, they're seeing a direct impact on their revenues due to the changes in service delivery. And they know for sure that once this physical health emergency is passed, the need for mental health care will definitely increase as we deal with that aftermath. But they don't stop looking for ways to meet their clients' needs. We're supported by our regions. Those regional administrators are really have their fingers on the pulse of what's going on across our state and I'm providing help and support for those providers as well. So again, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about the innovations and the professionalism and the compassion that provi providers have for their clients. Um, we have many challenges as well, but uh, I am confident that my members and all behavioral health providers across the state are going to rise to the challenge and make sure that their clients and anyone in need of mental health services will receive the care that they need. Thank you.
Great. Thank you very much, Annette. Appreciate it. And again, I think it's worth underscoring that mental health should be treated just the same as physical health. If you had a chronic condition like diabetes, you'd go to the doctor. Same things with mental health. If you have a mental health issue, you should go see a doctor, talk to somebody. It's about making sure that the complete person is being healthy here. And so I appreciate the comments about making sure that once we get past the physical health crisis here, we're also paying attention to the mental health that is going to be impacted by this as well. So thank you very much for being here today and for all, all that your providers do to be able to help make sure we're taking care of the mental health of Nebraskans. Okay. And so um, we have, let's see, oops. I think we had a couple other things uh, to be able to talk about as well. Uh, one of them has to do with the uh, uh, PPP. That's the uh, program the Small Business Administration put out to be able to make sure that small businesses would be able to get a loan to get people on their payroll. It's called the Payroll Protection Program. And we had uh, some folks up here earlier from the Small Business Administration. Uh, Leon Milobar, for example, was here. Jeff Kanger was here talking uh, from First State Bank, was talking about what they were doing to be able to provide those loans to our small businesses and really how they were working around the clock. And, you know, just put this in perspective, the Small Business Administration in 14 days put out more loans they, than they had done in the previous 14 years. It really was a tremendous effort by the Small Business Administration and our community bankers here in Nebraska. We've got 160 banks, and they all worked around the clock to be able to make sure that they could get those loans out. I mean, we heard before about the uh, bankers who were getting up early in the morning to be able to access the system because you had to apply online, and that system was getting bogged down with all the traffic that was going on from all around the nation. They were staying late at night to be able to do that. They had great relationships. I know that uh, my director of economic development, Tony uh, Goins, was on the phone at, sometimes at 1 in the morning trying to answer people's questions. Tony and Leanne both gave out their cell phone numbers to people to be able to call up and ask for questions. And all that hard work paid off in that we have the highest percentage of payroll being covered under that PPP program of any state in the country. There's a Bloomberg article out today that shows that Nebraska had 75% of its payroll, the highest in the nation. You saw a lot of the Midwest states uh, do that. And I think that's a combination of a variety of factors, but the, one of the biggest ones was that we have community bankers who worked really, really hard to be able to serve their customers and make sure that they did everything they possibly could to get those loans applied for with the Small Business Administration. So I want to just thank again our community bankers. Uh, I want to thank the Small Business Administration, thank my Department of Economic Development, all the folks who worked really, really hard to be able to meet the needs of the small businesses and put Nebraska number one in the nation with regard to being able to take advantage of that program and getting those small businesses the loans they need to be able to keep people on their payroll. So that's a, that's a big deal, and I really want to say thank you to all the folks who did that. Now, in a, a follow-on to that, uh, part of what we're going to see is that those small businesses are going to be hiring back people to come back in, right? So now they've got their loans, they're going to be looking to be able to keep those people on board. And as part of that program, if they keep those people on board, those loans will be forgiven. So it will become turned from a loan to a grant. One of the things I want to emphasize is that when you are one of those people that the, the small businesses call and ask back to come back to work, that um, you have to go take that job. Because if you don't, that's the same as quitting, and then you're going to lose your benefits under unemployment. So again, I want to emphasize that you have to take that. If, if you're called back to work, if you're on, on un unemployment and you're called back to work, you have to go back and take that job. Uh, or if you're offered a new job, you have to go take that job. Otherwise, you will lose your benefits under unemployment. You will lose the regular unemployment program. You will lose the pandemic unemployment assistance program. You will lose that. Um, and so. I just going to want to emphasize it to folks. If you're called back to work, you need to go back to work. If you're offered that job, you need to take that job. If you decide to stay on unemployment, then you actually will lose those unemployment benefits. And I'll give you an example. We actually, at the Department of Labor, offered a job to somebody who said, no, I'd rather stay home and just collect unemployment. Well, obviously, <laughs> that person's going to lose their benefits because you cannot do that. So, and we'll uh, certainly request the assistance of business in making sure that if there are people like that who are saying they'd rather stay home and take unemployment, then you just need to report that to us and then we'll process that, that appropriately. 
Um, do you have that? Do you have the, the yeah. yeah, if you can give me that, that'd be great. I've got a web address there for anybody who's got questions about that. Uh, you, can, you can go to ndol.unemploymenthelp at nebraska.gov. So the ndol.unemploymenthelp at nebraska.gov. If you have any questions about that or if, you want to, uh, if you're a business that has asked somebody to come back to work and they haven't done that, that's the, the place where you can send that email in and, and get, uh, answer, have your questions answered about that. Uh, also, we've been talking about, so earlier we had talked about our lodging program that we have for our health care providers and our first responders. And we also mentioned earlier in the week the partnership we're working on with the University of Nebraska, Omaha, University of Nebraska, Lincoln, and UNK to be able to use some of the dormitory rooms. And we are now ready to start rolling that out. Remember, we said there would be some National Guard people on campus this week getting this all set up. So we are now going to roll out that program for people who are looking for that quarantine or isolation. So again, if you've ex been exposed to somebody and you need to quarantine and you don't have a place to do that because maybe you've got somebody who might be at high risk at home, maybe somebody who's older with those underlying health conditions, uh, you can work with your local public health department to be able to get access to these dorm rooms. They'll be staffed 24 hours a day, seven days a week by the National Guard. It'll be a place where you can go and quarantine those 14 days or whatever you need to do to be able to uh, make sure that you're not infecting anybody else. We can also use that for people who are in isolation. If you've got, um, if, if you're starting to show symptoms and they're mild symptoms such that you don't have to go to the hospital, this would be another place where you could go. Also, we'll be looking at maybe using that for convalescence as well. So after you've gotten through the disease and you've, you've been in the hospital and you're not acute enough to stay in the hospital, this might be another option for there, though of uh, the folks that are gonna be taking advantage of this will have to make sure that they can still do their daily activities. So this is where you'd still have to be able to basically kind of take care of yourself, but it will be a place that will be staffed 24 hours a day. National Guard will be providing security to make sure we've got the access uh, you know, uh, secured for people going in and out of there. But again, that program is now ready and that will be accessed through our, your uh, public health district. So if you have a question about that, contact your local public health department. Uh, also, we had a question last night with regard from Mike from Pierce about the Liquor Control Commission and uh, he had liquor licenses both in Omaha and Lincoln and uh, actually he had renewed the one in Omaha as we did some of the research. Uh, if you need to, to uh, go look that up, I say suggest contact the Liquor Control Commission. You can go to their website, you can renew your licenses online and if you have to go into your city clerk's office and they are closed, the Liquor Control Commission has already waived any of the penalties associated with uh, not being able to uh, finish off that process or pick up your license because, um, due to that till the end of May. So again, if your city clerk's office is closed, you can't go in to pick up your license, any of those penalties are waived until uh, May 31st. So uh, again, kind of getting back to Mike's answer with regard to that. And then next week we have uh, the schedule, we'll be continuing to focus on doing these briefings at 2 p.m. Central Time right here. So we'll continue to do that next week on the weekdays. Uh, assuming the president doesn't have another phone call with the governors, we have to reschedule or rearrange. And then I will also be on the NAT Town Hall again next Thursday night at 8.30. Speaking of Nebraska, 8.30 to 9.30, just like we did last night. That's how we got the question from Mike from Pierce. Uh, so I will be on that again next week, and we'll have more information about who those guests are going to be as we get into next week. Uh, so now we'll go on to some of the questions that we have. Okay, from Grant Schulte, the Associated Press. What do you think the White House reopening guidelines, specifically uh, the emphasis on local control, how realistic, realistic is it for Nebraska? So again, I think we talked about this already. Uh, we think the phased in approach the President was talking about is exactly what we were talking about before. We're gonna put together a plan that is right for Nebraska. That may involve doing something instead of on a statewide basis, doing it regionally. Uh, again, I think that that's one of the things the White House also talked about. It could be implemented on a state by state or a county by county process. We're definitely gonna be looking at, you know, we, as you recall, we rolled out our, our directed health measures in a phased in way across the state. You can imagine we might uh, do those, loosening those restrictions in the same way. Is there anything that, in the guidelines that you don't like? Well, again, I think the guidelines are out there for us to be able to use and incorporate in what our plan will be, and that's what we will do. Is Nebraska still on track to lift some restrictions after the end of the month? Any specifics yet on what that might look like? 
Uh, again, I really want people to focus on these last couple weeks here in April with regard to stay home, stay healthy, stay connected. We will be looking at what, how, what and what kind of restrictions we might loosen in May and how that will be done. But as I said, though, this will be done kind of what the White House was talking about in a phased in, step-by-step -step type approach. Uh, isn't it going to be uh, difficult without more testing? If so, what can be done? So obviously testing is a part of the overall program. I do want to focus people on, the, on the, the real key, though, here is about the healthcare system. So the whole reason we put these social distancing processes in place was to make sure we don't overwhelm the healthcare system. We want to make sure that everybody who's seeking that hospital bed, that, I, that intensive care unit bed, or that ventilator has access to one. That is the real key. Testing is a tool we use to help preserve that access to the hospital system. So it's just a tool to be able to make that happen. There's other things we think about in making it happen, or you know, as we uh, look at how do we make sure we don't overwhelm the healthcare system. So testing is important. Uh, we also want to do contact tracing to be able to go back to people who've been exposed, make sure they're quarantining. All of that will be part of what we need to do to continue to make sure we preserve the healthcare system. But at the end of the day, that's the real measure. Were we able to take care of everybody who needed that hospital bed? From Rob McCartney at KMTV, uh, what can the state do to help nonprofits trying to stay alive during this pandemic? Well, uh, we've talked about some of this a couple of times. So the PPP program that was out there, that was available to nonprofits as well, so people could apply for that small business loan. There's other small business loans that are available maybe, uh, and I'd have to get Tony Goins up here, uh, but again, for traditionally non-people uh, who would not be eligible, so that would be one of the things to talk about. I'd say talk to your banker about that. Also, the pandemic employment assistance is also available for people who would not traditionally be available to get that help. So again, if you're a nonprofit and you're paying into the unemployment system, yes, your people will be eligible for that unemployment system. However, many nonprofits did not do that. But under the pandemic assistance uh, program, unemployment assistance program, you will be able to apply for those things. So that is part of the CARES Act. So if you were somebody working for a, non, uh, a nonprofit who was laid off, you're looking to be able to apply for the, that, can go to the Department of Labor's website. Remember, you do have to get rejected for the original unemployment system first, and then work your way through to be able to get to the pandemic program. And then is there anything, uh, uh, anything more than urging people to donate? Oh, well, I think I just talked about the more things that we're doing with regard to that. Okay, so I think that's the questions that we have. Let's go ahead, Taylor. Is there anything else on the text lines? No, I have two questions. One from David Earl. David uh, Earl. David Earl at KTV. He wants to know, can you tell people who want to test who don't qualify to now the guidelines when the state will have the capacity to give them a test when they want one? Yeah, so the question was from David Earl at KETV, uh, are there, uh, when will the state be able to provide testing for people who currently don't qualify because maybe they're asymptomatic or maybe they're not one of those high uh, uh, risk folks or maybe they're not one of our first responders or healthcare workers? When will people be able to get that? We are working to be able to provide that type of testing. I cannot give you a timeline on that yet, though I understand that there may be um, other private entities who are looking to provide that right now. So I'd certainly, um, you know, say that those resources may be out there, but if you're talking specifically from the state, we don't have a program for that right now. We're still prioritizing those uh, folks who are our healthcare providers, our EMTs, our firefighters, our police, correctional workers, those kind of folks. We're prioritizing people who are high risk. If you've got one of those underlying health conditions, if you're older, those are the folks we're still gonna continue to prioritize right now with regard to the testing. Uh, we are doing some community testing in places like Grand Island when we deployed additional resources there or in Hastings. Uh, we're doing some of that in some other places as well, but again, Generally, if you, if, to get to uh, David Earl's question, we are not there from the state standpoint to be able to provide anybody a test. We are working to exp expand testing, but right now we're not there. We have a question from Paul Hamill. He says, is there anything that governor can do to address daycare centers that are taking advantage of the crisis by charging clients to pay 100% tuition to retain a slot in their center? He says that's happening to kids who are keeping their kids at home right now. They see this unfair. So the question is uh, from Paul Hamill with regard to daycares um, and uh, charging parents uh, to keep their slot open at the daycare even though the kids are staying home right now and is there anything the government can do? And again, those are by and large gonna be private transactions. So if the parent is paying that voluntarily to keep their slot at the daycare, um, that's 
really kind of the parent's choice to be able to do that if they want to do that. There's certainly no requirement that they do that. Obviously, what we want to do is make sure we're looking to expand other health uh, daycare options. That's why we've done the executive order to allow uh, nonprofits, um, churches, and so forth to be able to provide more daycare uh, options for parents to be able to take advantage of those sorts of things. So maybe one of the options for those parents who are paying to keep their slot open in a daycare is instead of paying that, maybe they should uh, see if there's a, another nonprofit around that's maybe providing that daycare. Uh, but again, that's uh, really, you know, again, a private transaction and, and really needs to be negotiated between the, the person, the, the family, and the daycare provider. Questions from our studio audience. Um, we were wondering what you thought about Nebraska changing their uh, tuition rates or changing their dining rates to this. So yeah, University of Nebraska uh, rolling out a program to be able to make sure that uh, if you met certain income guidelines, I believe it was $60,000 a year that you'd be able to attend the University of Nebraska uh, tuition free. Great way to help make that higher education more affordable. And I uh, think that that's wonderful that the University of Nebraska is being forward thinking about how they do that for our, our folks here in Nebraska. So that's a good deal. Look forward to continuing to work with the University of Nebraska. They've been great partners. What specifically oh. will the National Guard be doing at the dormitories? Uh, are there going to be one per dormitory or one per campus, that sort of thing, and why is it necessary? So the question was, what are the National Guard from Fred Knapp, uh, what, what are the uh, National Guard specifically going to be doing at the dormitories, and why is it necessary? So what the National Guard will be doing is actually providing that security. Again, we're t asking people to isolate and quarantine, which means we don't want other people coming into those dorms, so they're going to be preventing people from going in. And then also, uh, again, those folks will generally need to be able to take care of their daily activities on their own. But if they need other help or some direction or something like that, the National Guard would be able to provide that. I believe they're also going to be taking the temperatures of anybody who goes into those dorms to, again, just make sure that we're monitoring the, the health of folks that are coming in and out of that. And uh, as I said, it will be staffed 24 by 7. So the number of National Guard soldiers there will really depend on what it takes to be able to do that. And then, Dr. Antone, I don't know if you had anything else you wanted to add to that. <clears throat> yeah, the National Guard has been great partners with us in this situation for the dormitories. Uh, they'll actually be uh, nurses, uh, medical assistants, and even mid-level practitioners such as PAs and nurse practitioners on site. The mid-level practitioners will be on site during the daytime hours, and then nurses and certified medical assistants will be there uh, 24 hours. Yes, they'll be National Guard members, and this is for the first two weeks and maybe even a few days longer if necessary until we get our staff staffing up for uh, uh, basically general population people coming in to staff those areas. There'll be a medical director in addition, and then since I'm a doctor, I'll be available too for any advice should patients specifically in isolation start feeling symptomatic so that they might need hospitalization so we can uh, either assess them personally or or make the assessment that they need to be transferred to a hospital so again national guard great partners in this to get this rolled out today yes i think it starts tomorrow The dorm rooms that I've seen all have their own separate bathrooms and, and food will be provided by the university as well as laundry services, I think, are set up, janitorial services, and as the governor said, National Guard will provide the security. I think it's important to note, even where there's room, uh, Dr. Antel, there's only one person in each room. Yes, one person in each room, yes. No social gatherings. So the plan is to use a lot of the newer dorms that have the single bathroom? Yes, these are the dorm rooms that are on the Dodge Street campus. So um, the National Guard is there now. They were there yesterday, and they're there today and again tomorrow. And they'll be obviously testing the people that uh, are at, at higher risk, but they'll all be also be testing some of the community uh, that, that are also maybe exposed. So those will all be done through the contact tracings 
that the public health and another epidemiologist have done. Did you want to add anything? Do you have another question for Dr. Anton? Well, Martha? I was I was curious as to whether you have any indication yet of what the demand may be for these dorm rooms. Uh, whoever wants to take that. It's uh, I can take that. And the question was is what what do we anticipate the the uh, probably the volume that we'll be getting as far as taking advantage of the quarantine and the isolation rooms at the specifically University of Nebraska Omaha now that we're rolling out. Well, at first when we rolled it out for the EMS and the healthcare workers, so we didn't see a lot of volume, but now we're up to, I think, 18 people taking advantage of that situation. So I think as word gets out and people know that it's available for them, I mean, obviously it's there, out there to protect their loved ones and their other personal contacts. And um, so we just thought it would be a service that be available to help those people that really can't self-isolate or quarantine at home. But you do need to perform your own daily activities in order to take advantage of these dorm rooms. What that, that you you need you don't need assistance bathing or feeding yourself. Things that you might see a need for in like a skilled nursing facility or a long-term care facility. And we're working on areas for that too. Well, there's 18 people that took advantage of the, the uh, health care worker situation. I think we have, uh, uh, I think we have uh, the capability of 200 rooms at UNO, I'm pretty sure. And even more in Lincoln, and I think even more, I think there's 400 in Kearney when that's necessary. So 200 dorm rooms at UNO. And 400 in Kearney and Lincoln. I think it's even up to 600 if necessary. done with the UNO topic? The dorm room topic? Okay. So thank you, Dr. Anto. Actually, I'm going to go to Lee, and then I'll come back to you, Martha. Lee? In regards to the SBA program that you that just talked about the numbers and how we rank number one, can you kind of talk about what that looks like for these companies? We know it's payroll benefit, but is this more rural, more Lincoln, Omaha? Where are we talking that this money is rolled out? You know, I don't have the data. The question was, how does this look like in the state of Nebraska overall? Is it more rural, more urban? I don't have the answers to that as to where those. I can tell you it was uh, 18,565 loans, uh, over $2.7 billion. And, but where that all goes, I couldn't tell you right off the hand. Maybe, Taylor, we can see. I'm not sure that data is out there, but we can try and look it up and, and find out. Uh, well, no, the, so that's actually that's more, greater than uh, the dollar amount, the $2.7 billion is greater than some states like Utah or Oregon, but on a percentage of payroll covered, that's where we're number one. So it's a percentage of payroll that we're talking about covering. We're covering about 75% of the payroll, and that's more than any other state. So if you think about some of the other states like California, they were at 24%. I think Maine was like at 63%. A lot of the Midwestern states, though, did very well in uh, applying for those loans and getting a significant a portion of their payroll covered by it. Martha. And following up on that, the, the program has run out of money, and do you believe that there should be more money put into that? Is there, is there additional, are there additional businesses that could benefit from it? So the question was, that program has run out of money, and are there other businesses that could benefit from that, and should more money be put in, essentially? And uh, with regard to that, I would actually defer to Congress on that. I have not followed up with how they did the determination of how much money to put in that in the first place and whether or not there's, I'm sure there's probably still demand out there. I just don't know how much that demand would be. And so I'd really defer that, that question to Congress because that was a, a thorough program. But I do, again, want to compliment our bankers here in the state because even though it's a federal program, it gets implemented through our community banks. And they did a fantastic job of really working hard to make sure we could take advantage of that program to get that money into the hands of our small businesses here in Nebraska. On the unemployment topic, there was talk about that $600 relief of some sort. Is there any update or where that, where that has gotten to? So uh, is Commissioner Alvin still out there? Yes. Oh, Commissioner Alvin's right here. Uh, Taylor, do you want to come up and talk about that with regard to the pandemic employment assistance? Sure. 
Right. Um, the question was, where are we at on the pandemic unemployment assistance? By the federal law, the first week that it was effective for started March 22nd, or 29th, I'm sorry. And we have not paid that week yet. We plan to run the script for that this weekend, and so that should be paid this weekend. We have paid uh, all claims filed for the most recent week, the week that ended on the uh, 11th. And we have paid the last number I saw, and of course it changes literally by the hour, but uh, we had paid about 16 million, over $16 million in the uh, extra compensation under the uh, Federal Pandemic Unemployment Compensation, FPUC. Sorry, I just, so the $600, just for clarification, because I kind of get lost in the numbers, the $600 you are working on that started at the end of March, and you paid that up and through? It's, April, like it's a weapon. It became available to people as of March 29th. The $600 became available as of March 29th. We did not get the software deployed yet that week because it was like passed on Friday and so it was kind of hard to have the software written by Sunday. Um, we did pay for the following week along with the regular claim. So we've paid that entire week and then we'll run the script this weekend to catch up. You run the script, John, maybe you can explain what that means. A, a script is basically the computer runs against all the people who claim during that week that ended on the 4th and they would. Software program. Software program, yes. And so we will run, we'll run that software run and they'll get paid this weekend. And then of course, going forward, it's automatic with everybody who files. And that's the way it was for the people who filed this week, um, or this last week that ended on the 11th. When they filed, they didn't have to do anything additional to get the $600. We just automatically added it to their regular state claim. And when we get the PUA up, uh, hopefully by Sunday, uh, we'll do the same thing with the PUA. We'll run pay everybody forward and then catch up the weeks prior if they have weeks prior. And just an update on the number of beds that we were talking about with our, our uh, Nebraska accommodation project. It's 240 beds at UNO, 200 beds at UNK, and 250 beds at UNL. Sure, do it again. 240 beds at UNO, 200 beds at UNK, and 250 beds at UNL. So the one, the, the one for you, the beds for UNO will start available tomorrow. Again, we'll work through your public health district, uh, public, local public health district to access those. We'll be rolling those out as, as we've got the uh, ability to do so. So I, I don't know, Dr. Antone, do you have a, a schedule for the other campuses? We don't have a, a, can, a schedule for the other campuses this time. And the other thing I would just addend to that, uh, add on to the end of that is that we also have, our, have agreements with the state college systems and NCTA. So we will have those campuses available as well at some point in the future. Question for Paul Hamill. He says, why are there more cases per capita in rural areas and urban areas of Nebraska? Does that heighten the risk of our healthcare system? <clears throat> so the question from Paul Hamill was, why are there more cases per capita in rural areas versus urban areas? And does that mean their healthcare systems are gonna be overwhelmed? I suspect Paul, and I haven't looked at numbers directly, that that's being skewed by Grand Island uh, we also had a number of cases in Kimball that was, and actually we also had a number of cases in Custer County that tend to be really focused around assisted living facilities or nursing homes. And so that's why I think you tend to see spikes up. So for example, you may recall last week, we sent out our National Guard team to Kimball County because we saw that we had an unusual number of uh, cases testing positive out there. So we deployed the National Guard. I think everybody we tested turned out to be negative except for the one person who we knew already had tested positive once. So uh, again, we had a bunch of folks that were associated with a nursing care facility, I believe, but nobody else in the community at least wasn't, didn't seem to be that prevalent. Uh, same thing I would say for Custer County as well. We had Callaway, and that was a, a nursing facility where we ended up moving some of the residents to uh, Great Plains Hospital in North Platte. They were a great partner in being able to get that done. But I think that kind of represents why, if you look at the map, Custer County has got more cases per capita as well. I think it's associated with nursing facilities. So I think there's specific explanations for why it may look like that, but some of the data is maybe being skewed around specific instances. And then the other thing I'd just say, just to kind of finish up the question about are there healthcare systems being overwhelmed? And the answer is absolutely not. Uh, again, where we've got the biggest hotspot in Nebraska right now is Grand Island, 
and we continue to manage that situation. The uh, folks there in Grand Island, I know, are working very, very hard. The public health people, the you know, the all the hospital workers, everybody's working really hard. But uh, I think as of this morning, they have uh, uh, of their ICU beds, they've got uh, uh, I see 12 of them are being used, 10 of them are being used for COVID patients. Isn't that roughly correct? And uh, eight of those are on ventilators. What are the numbers, Dr. Antonio? Just 12 on ventilators, 10 of those 12 are COVID positive. 12 on ventilators, 10 and 12 of those, uh, 10 of those 12 are COVID positive patients. I believe they've got 21 ventilators in that facility and 16 ICU rooms. So they, they are, again, certainly where they're working very, very hard, but we are managing it and everybody who needs that care has been able to get that care. We have time for a couple more questions. Sure. Yep, Jack. Has there been testing done specifically at JBS and other testing facilities? And the answer is yes. Uh, in Grand Island, we've worked out, uh, reached out to JBS. We were now in Hastings. I believe we worked, reached out, for example, to Western Reserve. So there has been specific testing at those uh, food processing facilities. Oh, I'll leave. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. So the facilities, uh, question was, are the facilities doing those tests themselves? The facilities don't have the ability to do the tests themselves. This is really the state of Nebraska and our public health department that is going and doing those tests. Um, while there are other systems like CHI who have been helping with testing in places like Grand Island because they've got a facility there. I know Brian here in Lincoln has their own ability to do testing. Well, there are individual hospitals that can do that. By and large, private entities can't do that on their own. They need the assistance of a healthcare organization to do it. Yeah, Lee. So the question was, what does overwhelm look like? And I think the extreme case of that would be, look at what happened in uh, Italy, where they had a number of patients coming into the hospital systems and the doctors there had to triage who was gonna get a ventilator because they didn't have enough ventilators for all the patients who needed one. So some patients were being left without that ventilator and of course that increases your fatalities. So that, that would be what I would consider, you know, getting your hospital system overwhelmed, that the people who are coming to your system were not able to get the care that they needed. That's exactly right. So as long as we have capacity to be able to continue to take people and put them in an ICU bed, put them in a hospital bed, put them on a ventilator, we are managing the situation and not being overwhelmed. Just yeah. Oh, I'll, I'll do two more. I'll, I'll, then I'll come back tomorrow. Yeah. And then I'm going to ask you to come up and tackle that one if you could, just with regard to what are your providers seeing with regard to people. We don't have specific numbers right now. Um, I did reach out and talk to the family helpline yesterday. They're seeing pretty steady as, as what they have been seeing. The requests that they're getting are parents calling in asking for coping skills. You know, they're at home now with their kids and maybe they're working from home and having to educate their kids. So it's not parents specifically looking for mental health services, but just how do I cope? How do I deal with this? But they are fully anticipating that once we get through this initial uh, wave of the physical health emergency, that then that's when those mental health uh, uh, demands will, will kick in. I mentioned the rural response hotline, the numbers that they're seeing, the calls coming into that line have definitely picked up. They were already picking up ahead of COVID, and now since COVID, they are right up there with the numbers of calls that came in during the farm crisis of the 80s. I think there's some mixed numbers as far as some of the other hotlines like suicide. I'm not necessarily hearing any increase from suicide hotlines. Have you heard, Sherry? I've heard in some places domestic violence hotlines, some are picking up, some not. I know there was concerns having people confined together that they wouldn't be able to make those calls, the people that needed the services. So it's something that we're certainly going to try to stay on top of, talking to our providers, listening to what they're hearing from their people um, that they're serving to see if those needs are being met. Um, but the, de the demand is, is it already was picking up uh, ahead of COVID, so COVID is just going to exacerbate that demand, especially once the initial emergency is over. And last question, Martha. Uh, it's for um, Boss. Okay. Well, 
because the telehealth is not being reimbursed, or what's, what's the issue? There's a variety of, of reasons why revenue is, is a concern. I mean, behavioral health in and of itself has always had to rely more heavily on public payers than other health care has. So we have that heavy reliance on public payers. It has traditionally been an under-resourced uh, 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 service as well. Um, we know the results from the study that D DBH did a couple years ago showing just how far below rates are below the actual cost of providing services. So we were already dealing with a s services that were under-resourced. Now we're adding a whole new way of delivering services. We've just you know, flipped overnight to telehealth services. And while most of those services are being reimbursed at the same rate as in-person, um, it's just maybe they're not seeing as many clients. Some clients aren't showing up for services. Like I said, some of the elderly and people on, with lower incomes that don't have access to the technology that can use um, those services. The residential services, they've had to make adjustments in how many people they could serve prior to COVID, so that's impacted their revenues. So, so just in general, when you're already dealing with a, a sector that has struggled to uh, be paid on par uh, with, with their needs, and then you add these, these extra emergencies, you know, you talk about the flood last year, so that increased demands. Um, what happened out in western Nebraska with the canal collapse, with what's going, was already going on in the ag economy and now being exacerbated by COVID. So there's just been a lot of piling on. So there, you know, there's definitely concerns about being able to, they want to make sure that they're going to be able to keep their doors open, not only through this emergency, but that they're ready uh, and able to serve what we are fully anticipating uh, an increase in, in demand for mental health services once this crisis is passed. You're going to be looking at those frontline workers who are going to be struggling with PTSD and people who have been confined and, you know, children trying to figure out how to deal with this emergency. So I think there'll be a lot of pent up demand once this emergency is passed. So, so our concern is to make sure that, you know, the dollars that have already been committed to, to behavioral health in this current budget, that those are preserved, that we can get those, uh, those services that have already been provided and maybe not yet paid for, that we get those paid for, as well as making sure that we're going to be able to keep funding, keep stability in the behavioral health system. Great. Thank you very much, and thank you all again for joining us here this afternoon. Next week again, we are planning on 2 o'clock Central Time for these briefings, uh, Monday through Friday, and I hope everybody has a great weekend. And remember, again, our six rules, stay home again, for the weekend. Hopefully you're not working this weekend, but if you are, make sure you socially distance while you're at work. Make sure that you shop once. Don't take the family out. Help kids play at home. Help our seniors and get that physical exercise in. Thanks very much. Everybody have a great weekend. We'll see you next week.